Why do humans play video games? When I ask you why do you play video games, I mean why do you play video games from start to finish? What is it that draws you in and keeps you in? I think, as with most things, there are many different answers to that question. I will talk about these different answers in different videos, but today I'm going to talk about the one that makes Dyson Sphere program the masterpiece it is. The sense of natural progression and optimization. Dyson Fear Program is a resource management game, and nothing more. That may not sound special, but with a 97% rating on Steam, there's obviously more to this game than you might expect. When starting this game, you begin with little to nothing, and your objective is to eventually turn the universe into a production line. The game is all about gaining resources for furthering that production. In this video, I will talk about how this mission is set up and the foundation the game is placed upon. Then I will cover the monumental task ahead of you, and how it seems like it's so far out of reach, it feels impossible. I'll talk about the trials and tribulations, as well as the satisfaction that you get when you overcome these. Finally, I will talk to you about how the game kept you playing from start to finish, and why it doesn't matter who plays this game, they leave with a positive impression of this amazingly crafted experience. When you start Dyson Sphere Program, or DSP for short, you start in the vastness of space, as a ship flying past a star. After a few short seconds, a person who refers to themselves as your advisor talks to you. He calls the place you are floating through the actual universe, telling you it's different from his and your homeland, and that you'll adapt to the laws of physics in a short period of time. Here is the first encounter with the high level of skill the developers who made this game have. I want to stop and break down these few seconds of the game a little bit. I'm not going to go into much depth about the story as a whole, because there really isn't one, but that doesn't mean that what is there isn't worth looking at. In one opening scene and 14 seconds of dialogue, this game has set up a fantastic premise for the player. If you completely miss this opening scene, the game isn't any less fun or exciting. This opening sequence is completely unnecessary to the part of the game that so many people like. However, I'd like to explain what we've learned from the first 30 or so seconds of the game. We've learned that there are no laws of physics at the homeland, the place the advisor and player are from. So one possibility is that they are from a place so alien to our understanding we couldn't comprehend it because there are no physics. That, coupled with the opening scene of drifting through space, gives you a deep sense of wonder and amazement that there is so much more out there that you're not seeing. This, coupled with the scope of your mission, in which you were sent here to industrialize an entire star cluster, gives you a sense that you're part of an unimaginably powerful civilization. The most likely answer to the place you are being called the actual universe and the both of you not knowing much about the laws of physics is that you are both virtual beings. This lines up with the fact that a lot of your research resources are presumably software code. This idea that is shown in the first few seconds is quite the reveal and has been used as a major plot twist for many storylines that precede it, but it's just laid out in front of you at the beginning of the game. I bet most players will look over this completely, being bombarded with new stimulus, which in and of itself is amazing. That so much is learned here and the knowledge you gain here only adds to the experience, where being ignorant of these facts takes nothing away from the experience, is masterful world building. This kind of fluid world building and detail is so important. This perfectly sets up all the events that transpire in the game shrouds the entirety of DSP in a kind of mystery that lets the imagination run wild, and they never explicitly spell out anything for you. I've played games that give you a significant amount of disposition that don't have a tenth of the staying power as DSP. Every aspect of this game reinforces the setting perfectly. You are creating materials that increase the available power output of your system, as well as creating more and more complex source code so the robot you can control and do more and more complex things. To get a little nerdy, the idea of source code being created out of materials is kind of video game logic-y. 
but if you consider how difficult it is to transport large quantities of information, and the idea that there are AIs capable of incredibly advanced thought and interactions while not wholly realistic, with a little bit of stretching, can account for everything you're doing in the game. So far, I've broken down this minuscule segment of the game, and I cannot stress enough how unimportant all of this information is to the actual gameplay and enjoyment you will have while playing. That what you're making or what you're researching doesn't need to be well fleshed out at all to make this game fun. Games like Cookie Clicker, where the entire point of the game is making cookies, can be fun without the fact that you're making cookies ever being relevant in the first place. There is a device used in fiction called the MacGuffin. A MacGuffin is an object, device, or event that is necessary for the plot to move and the motivation of your characters, but is insignificant, unimportant, or irrelevant in and of itself. This game could just have you making colored MacGuffin rods to power the ultimate MacGuffin machine, and what makes this game so good would be wholly unaffected. The developers know these facts, but still put a lot of thought and effort into making the game make sense from the ground up, and players can feel it while they're playing. Games come in a wide variety of experiences. There are three major ratios of story to gameplay that games follow. There are games where the story and gameplay are equal parts and build on top of one another to enhance the experience. Games of this ratio are usually masterpieces when the themes of the story are brought to another level because of the gameplay directly feeding into the themes of the story. Games like Disco Elysium where you choose your stats, directly affecting the voices you will hear throughout the game. This causes your outlook of the events to be colored before you even hear the first line of dialogue, further putting you into the shoes of the main character and affecting the ways you will interpret the events by controlling your inner monologues without even knowing it. The second are games where gameplay is nearly inconsequential to the story. Games like this stand out when the player either has a strong sense of ownership over the events that transpire and the outcome of the story, or games that are unabashedly telling a compelling story and gameplay is only a tool to tell the story itself. The extreme of this kind of game type is the walking simulator genre. But I'd like to point out the more gamified version of a walking simulator, stories like Telltale Games. These games without a story just aren't fun. If you removed every piece of story from this type of game, the games would be objectively bad. But if you removed the gameplay from them, they would still usually be good stories. The third type of game are the ones that are just fun and don't need a storyline or anything like it to be enjoyable. These are the games that have virtually no story at all, and if it does have one, you could completely remove any existence of it and it would still be a masterpiece of gameplay. Tetris is the most extreme example of this. Tetris will always be a good game. No story, no deep characters, no hidden lore, just gameplay, and it kills at its gameplay. People have played it and will continue to play it for hundreds of thousands of hours, for thousands of years to come. Games like this have no need to focus on story or even acknowledge its presence. There are games like this that have stories like Puyo Pop, but the stories have always been there as a way to introduce more difficult mechanics in a somewhat natural, if not a little forced way. A quick look at Puyo Pop Fever's Metacritic showed me out of the three reviews for this game, one of them mentioned the story, and all it said is that the story was good for a Puyo Pop game, which in any game less fun than Puyo Pop would be major disrespect. DSP has over 50,000 reviews, with the vast majority being read as overwhelmingly positive praise. Do you know how many times I saw the story or lack thereof mentioned in these stellar reviews? Not once, putting this into this third category. So, we know Dyson Sphere Program falls into the category of game where story is unimportant. So why is the entire section of this video devoted to breaking down this short 30 second clip of story? Because putting that kind of thought and detail into a world shines through every part. There is enough thought into this opening scene to completely enhance all elements of the game that are part of it. While this game is still in the third category of games, the gameplay aspect of this game is much more satisfying and enjoyable than a majority of other games in this category. And while this scene does fit well into the game's setup, it does little for the game on a superficial level. 
but details like this only happen in games that leave a lasting impact, which Dyson Sphere program does. Once you've landed on the planet your advisor has picked for you, you can set off and start working and creating your Dyson Sphere. Woo! Well, not really. It'll be many hours before you can even make one of the most basic items you need for making the Dyson Sphere. If you don't know what a Dyson Sphere is, it is a spherical vacuum. It acts as something similar to a Katamari. It rolls around sucking up anything it can until it gets bigger and bigger, eventually getting big enough to suck up planets and eventually stars, converting their power into pure kawaii moe energy. <laughs> when you finally have enough energy, you can begin combat with the Dust Devil Sphere and the evil cluster of attacking Roombas. I'm just kidding. Dyson Sphere is a theoretical construct. It was first conceptualized by Olaf Stepleden. I don't know how to pronounce that. I probably butchered it. I'm sorry. And it was conceptualized as a loose concept in his fictional book. It was then popularized when Freeman Dyson did a thought experiment about space-faring civilizations. It was his answer for how a civilization could have the energy to travel through space after using up all the resources of their home planet. Basically, it's a structure that surrounds a star, absorbing all the energy that it emits. This is the end goal of the game, encasing stars and structures to siphon their energy to then send it to the homeland. While I thoroughly complimented the game's setting earlier, this is one of the biggest issues I felt while playing through the game. This goal and how unobtainable and extra this idea was. In a second, I will go on to talk about the start of the game, but the scale and effort to do something like encase a star is honestly unfathomable. I understand the developers who made the game can introduce any kind of balancing system they want. They could make one jar of farts have the same output as a hydrogen bomb if they wanted to. And some developers do. But inconsistencies like this take away from the player's experience when it's supposed to be a serious game. I felt the scale of the Dyson Sphere was significantly out of place after the impact the opening scene left on me. I won't talk about this issue except maybe one other time. But as the end goal and namesake of the game, the Dyson Sphere seemed like it was at best impossible and at worst wildly unnecessary. However, that is the end goal, and we've taken our first steps, so let's not get ahead of ourselves. So, no Dyson Spheres and no Dust Devil Battles. Yet. What you do have is your avatar, the Icarus, and a couple of starting materials you can pull from your pod that you brought here with you. The advisor explains this to you in some of the basic commands. He explains how to collect resources, how to check your inventory, how to do some basic crafting, research the technology, and so on. This is the extent of the advisor's help though. He will explain how to operate and use new technologies when you acquire them, but he never gives you specific directions or gives you any kind of hints to go a specific way. There are no paths to follow or invisible boundary walls for you to hit. The main structure of the game comes from the research tree, which you need to unlock each aspect to gain new technology. It's the main form of currency for the different source codes I mentioned briefly before. Before you can even make your first section of source code though, you're going to need to start gathering materials for it. You can cut down trees, break apart rocks, and mine minerals. One thing you'll notice quickly is that while trees and rocks get collected very quickly, the mineral veins you find are not, and don't disappear after you gain some of the materials from them, unlike trees. In fact, the tree has a small amount of wood, a mineral vein can have hundreds of thousands of ore, and mining each one of them isn't quick. So after doing some gathering for basic materials, it's time to look at what you can do besides gather. You'll find a few basic recipes, you can make a few basic items like iron and copper bars, but you don't really know what they're for yet. That's really it though, since your list of building recipes is empty. So it's already time to look at the research tree. The research tree is how you can create more items, create different kinds of buildings, and upgrade the Icarus. You need to craft certain items for each upgrade, with the earliest tech discoveries requiring materials like microchips and iron bars, and then quickly only requiring large quantities of the colored source code cubes. There are six different source code blocks and I would consider there being different tiers of advancement. 
Tier 1 is tutorial slash basic, Tier 2 is the early game, Tier 3 is mid game, Tier 4 and 5 is late game, and then the Tier 6 source code is the end game. You get access to very important aspects of the game with each new set of source code, and the basic increase in tech with each new tier of it. Like I said though, the very first upgrades require materials, so let's start researching. You'll quickly realize, as with any resource gathering endeavors, that you start requiring large quantities of materials for anything. Getting 10 iron ore to make 10 iron bars doesn't take very long, but gathering 100 iron ore and 50 copper ore to make 100 microchips and 50 gears takes much, much longer. We've barely even gotten started. So instead of sitting your Icarus in front of an iron ore vein for 20 minutes, you will probably build a mining machine to automate this process. This machine will mine ore 20 to 100 times faster than you ever could without it. And that's with only one single machine. So you'll likely build multiple ore gathering machines and place them in front of different veins to gather for you. The issue is these buildings require power to operate. Luckily, there's research for wind turbine power generators. You can make more and more of these to meet your power demands. So now you can gather that 150 ore in seconds. Bitchin. Making the bars takes time though, so you'll doubtlessly automate that process as well. In order to do this, you'll need to build conveyor belts that feed into the smelting buildings you'll have to set up and have them smelt out iron and copper bars for you. So now that you no longer need the Icarus to smelt the ore manually, you can grab some of those bars to start making microchips. But why would you stop here? You can access the assembler in the tech tree, so you'll probably research it. So why not use these assemblers to automate the building of microchips too? You can build some conveyor belts from the smelters to the assemblers and have them do the work for you. And then adding more wind turbines when necessary. The smelters will get backed up though. So instead of having them directly feed into the assemblers, you can build storage units so you can access these bars later whenever you need them for other types of work. While you don't have an immediate use for microchips, you're likely going to store them as well. This will likely be a strategy you end up adopting for future production lines, just storing them whenever you finish them so that you have the materials for later. All right, now every second you have two microchips being made. You don't really need to do anything for this to keep happening. I'm not going to talk you through every step of the game, but I wanted to talk to you about the first steps, talk about different aspects of the game. Right now, you'll have two microchips being made every second with tons of ore being mined and lots of bars being smelted from these ores. Your ore mining machines will probably be backed up, but that's not really a problem since veins of ore are finite. You could make sure that you have enough smelters so that you never have a backup of ore, but I've started answering the first question I asked in the video without you even knowing it. I've talked about taking a process that takes minutes to make 10 microchips and how a person can go from mining the ore with the Icarus, then making the ore into individual bars, and then using those bars to make those 10 microchips that you'll need. And then instead of doing this process every time, spend a bit of time up front automating the steps. And now you can make those same 10 microchips with no player interaction in only five seconds. It feels satisfying to take a process that takes time and effort and replace it with the automated process that takes less time and no effort after the initial investment. The advisor didn't tell you to set up these mining buildings or to automate the production of iron bars or even set up the production line for the microchips, but you will have done it anyway. At this point, you're not even thinking about the two microchips that you're making every second, and you will likely not have to think about it again for a long time. Instead, you've already started thinking about what you need to do next to automate your first source code cube tier, not even considering making them manually. You haven't been given a hint of direction from your advisor, but here you are on your way to making your first bit of source code for your virtual homeland, and you haven't even stopped to ask yourself why. The reason is because it's just fun. We are making these more and more complicated production lines and why you do it or what you are making isn't really important. Just the fact that you're 20 minutes into the game and you've set up a production line that if you hadn't, making the same number of items using the Icarus's crafting and mining capabilities would have taken you 20 hours is a good feeling. 
that's one of the nice things about this game too. While automating is really nice and effective, you don't have to automate every single thing you do. You don't always have to automate your processes. You can brute force the creation of something, like I commonly do for buildings. You could actually just brute force the entire game. I doubt anyone will ever do that, but it's not impossible. And just knowing that whatever automation you're doing is beating out that slowest playthrough by leaps and bounds is a good feeling. However, you will likely strive to better your systems and clean out your blockers to make it all as efficient as possible. This is what the tutorial slash beginning is all about. The way the tech tree works is that it will give you a nice amount of tools and tricks and a healthy amount of upgrades for the Icarus at each tier. There will come a time when you have an efficient set of gathering operations and you finally set up a supply line to feed your tier 1 production lines and you can move on to the early game or tier 2. The biggest annoyance you'll come into for a majority of the game and when the game cycle starts to form is power shortages. You'll be very familiar with this in the early game as it will have been ripe with this. Wind generators are a decent source of power, and making sure you have large amounts of them all over the planet is just an easy way to keep ahead of power demands. But every time you go to start a new production line, you'll need a lot of extra ones to keep up with the power demands. If you connect new production lines to your old power grid, you'll make a big hit on it. If you start the new production line solely with new generators, you'll need to add a lot more for each building you make. Even with the wind generators as a nice added power extra, it is around this time that you are going to start lacking. You'll also realize that logs and plant fuel have become less and less ideal for your Icarus's power supply. That's right, your Icarus requires power as well. So it's time to upgrade your power supply, and this isn't actually that difficult. You'll have things like coal or oil all over the place. Solar power is an option, for your base, not for Icarus, but it only helps when the sun is on it. And making that many solar panels would cost a lot of materials, like a whole lot. So we start using thermal power plants and graphite rides instead. Thermal power is a building where you feed it fuel sources like coal to generate power. It's a really nice way of keeping your power grid supply ahead of the demands of the buildings you are going to get up and running. Another fuel source you may have noticed if you're actually a human playing is oil. You can go around finding oil rich locations all over the planet. These oil veins are actually kind of infinite. They lose half of their distribution rate every 12 hours, so while it will get slower over time, it will not be anytime soon. You can also still use the wind turbines and why not? There's still a good way to top off your power grid, and you need to put something near production buildings so that they get power. But thermal power is really pumping out way more energy than you need, so you're fine for a while. At this point, some of your main production lines may start to run dry. You may have set up some ore mining buildings at places with very small veins, or you may not have. Either way, you're going to realize something sooner or later. That first microchip production line you made is going to run out of power. When that does happen, you have a couple of options. You can pack up shop and move all the buildings somewhere else, or you can grab further away ore veins and mine those. You can vary belt them back to the microchip creating plant from the beginning. You'll always have a use for every material in the game except for a rare one or two. This is actually a really nice aspect of the game, always having a use for all of your materials. So letting the production count of any of them diminish is going to end up with you being short on supplies everywhere. So making sure you always maintain old structure gives purpose to everything you do from the start of your game. As time goes on, there will be more and more items you'll need to make, eventually needing to make items with raw materials that are extremely hard to come by on the planet the advisor picked for you. You can search all over the original planet, but eventually you'll start needing things that you just really don't have things like titanium ore or silicone ore. So where can you get it? You can look over your entire planet, but you won't find any titanium or silicone veins. Silicone can be crafted using a chemistry lab, but if you want titanium ore, you're SOL. So what can you do? 
Well, I call this the early game instead of the tutorial for a reason. It's time for one of the coolest research tree nodes to finish, and it's time to head out on your first foray into the final frontier. That's right, it's time to head to space. This is the first time the game changed in a way I wasn't expecting. When I reached this point, I had been spending all of my time improving production output, assuming I'd eventually have the ability to go to other planets, but not necessarily needing the ability or knowing what it would entail. When I realized I had unlocked space travel and I could leave the planet I landed on, I was pretty excited. It was the first time I felt awe in this game, and it was also the first time I felt another feeling I wasn't expecting. I know this game has saves, and I know that, at least where the game is in Early Access right now, there is no combat, so you can't die. Even so, as I left my planet's orbit and drifted towards the next planet, I felt an intense fear for the first time while playing this game. Turning and speeding up in space both decreased the Icarus's energy supply. What if I missed the planet? What if I landed and I didn't have enough fuel to get back? How long would I be out there before I could return again? The advisor didn't prepare me for interstellar travel. He just told me which keys do what. Space is really fucking scary. And I will likely never be an astronaut. I will never know or understand that feeling all astronauts talk about having when they go into space. But even in the slightest, DSP gave me a glimpse of what that must be like. When you're in the first couple of minutes of the game on a track set by the developers, it's really neat. But actually taking my first steps back in put that feeling in me that I wasn't expecting when I picked up this game, or any of my time playing had led me to think I was going to feel. It's incredibly hard to make a player care about what the characters they're playing as care about or sync up their emotions and desires. A lot of time you will play through a game because you like the story, or because it's fun, without ever really thinking you're feeling the same fear or joy the character you're playing is. However, when I jumped into space because it was the location of the next goal I had, I was overwhelmed with a sense of unpreparedness, doubt, and wonder. This was an honest to goodness oh shit moment for me. And even though this is just a game, I immediately wanted to head back to my home planet knowing I wasn't all that prepared for the journey, and I just nonchalantly tried to set myself out upon. This is the exact moment when I really began to fall in love with the choices the developers made in this game, but it was far from the last time. Once you have achieved space travel, you can technically win without anything more than what's available to you. However, this goes back to my first talking point, automation and optimization. At this point, you've been optimizing and automating your process, then you're not going to want to stop. But it's at this point when things start becoming apparent, you're going to need a large amount of power moving forward. I mentioned it before, but wind and thermal power are your best bets on your home planet. But thermal power requires the byproducts of production, like refined oil and graphite cylinders. Using this on other planets, especially brand new planets you just landed on, would prove very difficult. Wind power also varies from planet to planet, with some planets having no wind and others having a shitload of wind. It's still a good way to add power to any power grid of a planet that has wind power, but no matter what, it's hard to supply a planet with power using only wind energy. So wind power is actually kind of a bust off of your home world. However, at this point, you probably have an abundance of the most basic materials. Remember before when I said solar power was a waste? I said it's inefficient because it needs to be able to see the sun at all times. And since the planet rotates, they aren't a very effective way to use them if you don't have a lot of them. At this point though, you have a lot of production power on your initial planet, and placing the solar panels even spread out won't be easy, and you might have to leave them out of large sections of the planet because there's production in those areas. That's why on a new planet it's a super effective strategy to set up a lot of solar panels equidistant spots all over the surface. New planets won't have a lot of production at the start, but the more advanced your production gets, the more power you will need. 
So, while your new planet is pumping out power like nobody's business, it has no production setups on it, and your base planet will need much more power than it can handle. There are ways to trade power between planets at this point, and as time goes on, making sure you have a solid distribution of power is important. You'll need more and more power and with more and more production. The cycle will continue until you finish the game. When I had originally planned out this video, I was going to go through the high level of the entire game. I was going to talk about warp speed, make far too many Star Trek jokes, and discuss the game loop in depth. But I think I've talked enough about the gameplay to cover some of the more important themes I want to pick at. I want to dive deeper into the question I proposed at the beginning of the video. When you're playing a game, you're really enjoying it, why can't you play that game forever? Why you might drop a game after a while, and most importantly, I want to answer these with regards to the masterful execution of Dyson Sphere program. I have played games for 10 hours that vastly overstayed their welcome, and I've played games for over 800 hours that I still think about and want to play more of today. For the vast majority of people who are watching this, 800 hours into a single game is far too much time. But why? Why is 800 hours of one game worse than 10 hours of 80 games? Is it because you see less worlds? Is it because you think it will just get boring? If you like playing any games at all, it doesn't matter who you are or what you're like, you could play a game for 800 hours. But the idea spending that much time with any one game is an appalling thought to most people. I'm not here to argue the point with you on whether you could or could not spend that much time with a single video game, but to discuss why you might cringe at the idea of it. And while you might cringe at the idea, not blink once over looking back at the past 800 hours of games you have played. The reason is not a crazy one either. It's because each one of these games held your interest until they didn't. The reason you would never want to play 800 hours in a video game is because there's probably no game that's ever held your attention for even half that time. Each game you've played in the last month, year, or decade even, has at one point held your interest and then at one point lost it. It might be after the ending, after multiple endings, after achieving 100% completion, or after the first 20 minutes of the game but at some point you lost interest, or you'd be playing it. Maybe another game came along, maybe a gameplay loop got stale, but at some point you just couldn't be bothered anymore. I've been misleading you a little bit. I don't actually want to get directly into what kind of game can hold your attention for hundreds of hours, but I wanted you to start thinking about what kinds of games might hold your attention for that long and at the very least understand why another person might play a game for such a long period of time. What I do want to talk about directly is why 97% of the people who bought and reviewed the game rated it positive on Steam, and most of the reviews you will see are from people who have spent at least 100 hours playing it, and a large majority of them have 300 plus and several, just at a glance, have over a thousand hours played even if you yourself could never bring yourself to hit these hours played. The first part of this that I want to talk about is difficulty. I've talked about difficulty before, and I will again, but there are a few ways difficulty can be used to enhance or hinder an experience. If you're like me, you might be a difficulty junkie. I love harder difficulties and harder games. This is not one of them. But what makes a difficult game rewarding is very much present and a part of what makes DSP so loved. It's the drive to overcome obstacles and improve yourself. A lot of games have quote unquote obstacles, but they really don't feel like they do. Games like Uncharted have a set of ledges that form a path or multiple paths to get from one area to the next, but it's really just a linear path with little to no actual obstacles to overcome. It's never really all that difficult or fulfilling. It can be fun, and it usually is, but not because you get the satisfaction of overcoming the objective, but because the discovery and activity itself is enjoyable. DSP is able to give you that feeling of satisfaction for overcoming trials in the same way a well-balanced and difficult game can. You may be a production guru and you've got a well-balanced system for powering up the grid and increasing production to maximum efficiency. Maybe you're an Italian chef, 
and you throw spaghetti everywhere. It doesn't matter, because when you reach space travel, you'll both be able to look at your base and say, look at all that shit I've accomplished. I'm pretty cool for doing it. You get that sense of satisfaction even when there is no actual difficulty, because the difficulty at its core is overcoming your own limitations. In progressing through DSP, you'll make your setups a little better each time, and you can see it in each new production line. One example of the challenges of the game that will be satisfying despite your skill level is whether or not you're prepared is when your iron ore minerals run out. At some point, like I said earlier, you'll need to handle the eventuality that you'll run out of a raw material. You could potentially handle it well before it happens and have a backup ready well ahead of time. If not, then you need to overcome that challenge when it arises in a number of ways. Whichever it is, you will likely feel good about overcoming this challenge. However, challenges are not the only reason this game receives so much praise. This isn't the first time I've brought attention to this, but games are art. Whether it's the beauty of a world's aesthetic, or what the world conveys to you that is special, games have meaning and soul. DSP lets you, like many other games before, add a little bit of your soul into it as you play. Cosmetics when it comes to equipment can be a dicey subject. It comes into a function over fashion debate that every person has with themselves. While I am usually on the side of function over fashion in a single player game, I have replaced my equipment for a slight downgrade in quality for a huge upgrade in style. Games with creation capabilities like DSP though are fairly rare. DSP allows you complete control over how your production line looks. There are some good ways and some less than good ways to set up a production line, but no matter how efficient or sporadic you make it, it is your design. It has your soul in it. You can place a large set of buildings anywhere you want, and you can focus to making them all in a row so that adding to it is simple, or you can just place buildings whenever and wherever you want, letting the conveyor belt sort out your production lines. No matter what you do, you'll have an intense sense of ownership over what you've done. There are other games where you can do this, but this game definitely stands out in its own way. It's not as free as maybe a Minecraft or a Sims game, but it gives more functionality and purpose to every action you take than both of those games do. You'll be able to transport supplies across planets, across the universe, heck, even across the galaxy. You can revisit your first iron production line and compare it to your newest one because there was never a reason to renovate it. This differs from Minecraft and The Sims in which you usually upgrade your house or your base by removing the old and replacing it with newer designs. In Dyson Sphere program, you can look at your past and how you've grown and admire how far you've come and how masterfully you continue to be. Playing a game for a second time or a new game plus and seeing how easily it is to blow through it is nothing compared to seeing your first microchip farm next to your most recent quantum processor line. You can track your progress and your journey and because of the way the game has been set up you most likely will. Seeing a memorial of every obstacle you've overcome, design choice you've implemented, and decision you've made, immortalized in your different production lines. So far in this video, I've talked about the general progression of the game. I've told you what different milestones are going to be and what makes Dyson Sphere Program so special it may not be clear yet, but we're almost at the point where you can understand it in its entirety. I want to pause for a moment to talk about two different IPs that will help reveal what makes this game get so many positive reviews and gives it so much staying power to anyone who plays it. It may seem abrupt, but I promise it's relevant. The first is Stanley's Parable. To sum up this game extremely quickly, it's a game where you have a narrator narrating what you are supposed to do. The player can either listen to the narrator or ignore them. One thing that game makes abundantly clear in not only its inception, but its popularity, is that when you're playing a game, you will likely stray off the beaten path from time to time. Maybe it's out of boredom, Maybe it's out of curiosity, or perhaps it's just in spite of someone forcing their intentions on you. 
Stanley's parable rewards these breaks from the path with different scenarios, and it stands in juxtaposition to games that will have you follow the narrative and doing anything counter to the narrative is extremely immersion breaking. This game is an extreme example of this to be sure, but I'm sure 90% of the games you've played, you at one point did something stupid and immersion breaking. Stanley's Parable likes to play with this idea, but other games will go as far as having 100% scripted action scenes where even if the player just fails each and every quick time event, it just continues on, being funny at best and completely immersion and agency breaking at worst. It's just natural to want to mess around with the puppet master's intentions and test the boundaries of your freedom. Even if a scene is supposed to be heart wrenching, we can run into walls and try to shoot NPCs. That's just how people are. Which brings me to my second IP, Inception. Inception is a movie about planting an idea into someone's head so it takes root as if it was their own. In video games, it would be getting a player to do something in game because they wanted to and not because the developer had scripted it. They will almost always have scripted it, but the idea is to make the player feel like these conclusions came of their own free will and not because it was forced on them. The movie Inception explores other abstract themes, but how difficult it is to plan an idea into a person's head is why Stanley Parable even exists. It's why we laugh at videos where someone plays a story game but fails every quick time event just to see the dumb things the developers added in such a case. It's why sometimes you'll go the opposite direction when there's a character's life at stake just to see if you can. It's hard to put someone on a track without them eventually looking down to try and see how far they can affect their trajectory. Some games allow a lot of freedom in their devices. Games where you can kill the final boss in the first few seconds. Like Breath of the Wild. There are games where there is almost no track at all. Make no mistake though, while Dyson Sphere Program feels more free than even Breath of the Wild, it is one of the heaviest scripted games you'll come to, and you won't even realize it. Most people who will have played this game will do the same things I've talked about to this point. Have the same fear when they reach space for the first time, make the same decisions as me, feel the same emotions. The advisor never tells you what to do, but the tech tree has been developed in a way that every player will do the same thing in the same order. That doesn't mean there aren't moments like the ones I talked about before. Sometimes I'll try to jump on buildings to see how high I can go. But two things keep the immersion intact always. The first is that we got one line of dialogue from the beginning that explains all of your behaviors. You are currently experiencing your first time ever the laws of physics. Of course you're curious. And while I may be jumping around like an idiot, the production lines have never stopped producing. I am still making every single supply I set up a production line for through all of the automation. I can sit down and do nothing for hours and I'm only benefiting. There is no timer ticking down. There is no one I have to save in five minutes where a 10 minute potty break puts their life still five minutes from death. The Icarus is a brand new robot not used to physics. Of course it's gonna jump around from time to time. This is one of the greatest masteries the game has to offer. The unification of what they want you to do and what you want to do without you ever questioning it. There is no perceived penalty for wasting time, only the cost of not improving production so you can create more faster. This set of checks and balances have made for a masterfully crafted progression system, always making it not only interesting to improve production, but making it flashier and more exciting to do it as well. It's crowning achievement that most games can't even touch is its ability to push you forward without you ever feeling like anything is moving you besides your own two feet. That is actually one of the most important and best parts about this game. You will constantly deal with a relentless balancing act. Sometimes you need materials, sometimes you need power. This balancing act is the core loop of the game. You'll have a lot of power, and you'll need a lot of supplies, and then you'll have the supply chain finished but get low on power. This incremental climb is always solved in a new and fun way. 
always in the nick of time because that's what the developers want you to experience. I still remember when the big revelation of the game hit me. I said at the very beginning of the video that making a Dyson Sphere was at best impossible and at worst overkill. But there will still come a time every trick you've tried up until that point just doesn't work anymore. You'll never have enough power, or at least you can never really get ahead enough to have the freedom to create that you used to. The time I'm talking about will be at least 60 to 70 hours into the game. You'll be going about your loop of increasing power consumption and then power output, and then you'll realize it out of nowhere. Maybe the Dyson Sphere could give you the power you need. I have to stress this because I haven't talked about this process. Every part of creating the Dyson Sphere is difficult. By difficult, I mean you can easily get to right before you beat the game without ever touching the Dyson Sphere mechanic. And to get supplies set up for your Dyson Sphere can take 10 to 20 extra hours of setup. And while you may have spread that time out by making them this entire time, until now they served no purpose. So, up until this point, it seemed like the Dyson Sphere was completely pointless. And it was. Everything about it felt unnecessary, the majority of my playthrough. So when I finally realized it was the answer to all of my problems, it's like when you're watching a movie and the most obvious answer was in front of the actors all along, but they just didn't see it even though the audience knew it was there. There is virtually no story in this game, but this was one of the wildest plot twists I have ever been a part of. In terms of the game, I thought the name Dyson Sphere Program was cute, but the mechanic of the Dyson Sphere was pointless. When I realized how wrong I was, and that the Dyson Sphere was the answer to all my power woes, just like it was conceptualized back in the 60s as the ultimate power source for a spacefaring civilization, I was so giddy with excitement. It's hard to explain this to someone who may not have played it before since it's in the name, but it's precisely because it's in the name that the Dyson Sphere just ended up being so unexpectedly cool. I'm telling you, I actively thought the inclusion of the Dyson Sphere as a mechanic was dumb for most of my time in the game, just to end up having to eat my words right at the end. It was priceless. This discovery is why you play games, because the player can be led down a direct path, be told what they'll find at the end, and still be elated when they find out what's there. You start in space. And when you go to space for the first time, you're instilled with an emotional cocktail of fear and excitement. You see the star system when you first start playing the game. But when you can warp to different systems, you feel like you're exploring unknown ground. The game is called Dyson Sphere Program. But when you finally come to the realization you need to devote time to creating your own Dyson Sphere, it's like finding out you were in the Matrix. The developers had been at the wheel the whole time, and I didn't even know it. I've talked about it at length in this video, but it wasn't until this moment that I personally realized the developers were holding my hand the entire game. It was at this moment that each and everything I've talked about up until now actually hit me. I was just enjoying my time messing around in the game thinking I was playing some StarCraft slash Minecraft hybrid. But the entire time, each and every decision was already made for me like I was playing Uncharted. Dyson Sphere Program is a game about giving the player the illusion of unlimited freedom so they can feel like they are the masters of the universe, but still tailoring the experience in a way that they will always enjoy themselves to the fullest. This video has been a bit different than the last two I've done. It's more of a retrospective than the previous two. However, I just could not get that revelation of when I decided myself to make the Dyson Sphere out of my head. It's rare that a game or a movie pulls one over on me, and while I had liked the game up until that point, I really thought the Dyson Sphere aspect of Dyson Sphere program was a miss, just to find out it was a Grand Slam home run the entire time. I hope you all liked this type of video, because this will be one of the types that I do moving forward. There are going to be games that I really, really like, that have no deep hidden aspects to them, 
but I want to talk about anyways. I think most games have a moment that defines them. I think games need more than just a moment to be good. Dyson Sphere was fun long before I came to my revelation, but having that revelation helps cement the experience for me. I've already got some idea for other games I want to talk about, so I hope you're looking forward to it. Remember to like, subscribe, and leave a comment down below. I'd like to read them all even if I can't get to them all. I appreciate every one I get. Feel free to go back and check out my other two videos. I have my Kenshi video where I explore the revelations of what can happen when you only think about morality of your actions and not the consequences. And I have the Amazing Cultivation Simulator video. And if you can get past the horrendous sound quality, you can hear me talk about rising to the challenge. Anyway, thanks for reaching the end of this video. Bye-bye.